All right, welcome back, Chem 212 students, for our next lecture on uh, chemical reactivity. Uh, previously, we discussed how we can determine if a reaction is spontaneous or not, and that is based on the so-called delta G, or the change in Gibbs free energy. If it's negative, the reaction is spontaneous. If it is positive, the reaction is non-spontaneous. We talked about what that means in terms of equilibrium. Uh, spontaneous reaction has more products at equilibrium and less reactants. Non-spontaneous have uh, not very many reactants and will have more, or not very many products. It will have mostly leftover reactants. So clearly, when we're thinking about a reaction, we want a reaction that will produce for us more products. If our goal is to produce the product, and will not leave a bunch of reactants. Left. There will always be some reactants left over. Uh, now that tells us whether a reaction will go forward or not. It doesn't tell us how quickly that reaction will happen, which is another thing that's very important. Reaction that goes very slowly is not going to produce a lot of products, even if it is spontaneous. Um, and so you can think of, for example, uh, rusting. Rusting is generally a slow process. It takes a while, how, and it, but it is spontaneous. Eventually, if you leave your, your weights out or some piece of iron out, it will rust. It does take a long time. Um, and so we also want to know not only will a reaction happen on its own, but how long will it take? Um, and so uh, uh, we want to know about the rate. We're interested in the kinetics. The delta G doesn't tell us anything about that, really. Uh, what we need to think about is what's called the activation required to make the reaction start. Um, some reactions are very fast, like something exploding, but for example, the formation of a diamond from carbon graphite, which is pencil lead, uh, can take a long time. And so, um, we are concerned here not only with spontaneity, but also the uh, So the reaction uh, it rate is affected mainly uh, by the number of successful collisions between molecules that result in a reaction. The number of collisions depends on other factors. For, um, so, for example, concentrations. The more you have reactants dissolved in a solution, like dissolved in water, for example, the more of them there are there, the more likely they are to collide with one another. The more likely action. Uh, the activation energy, which we'll talk more about in a moment, this is the energy of the collision that's required to, uh, to cause a reaction to occur. For some reactions, it's more energy than for others. And so the lower the activation energy, the easier it is for a reaction to occur upon a collision. The temperature will matter for two reasons. Um, remember, the temperature is uh, directly proportional <clears throat> uh, to the average kinetic energy, or the average speed, very simply. So the faster the molecules moving, the faster the speed, uh, uh, faster the, or the kinetic energy, rather, the faster the speed the molecules moving. On, uh, so the the, a higher temperature increases the average speed of the molecules, which increases the likelihood they will collide uh, with sufficient energy to, to overcome the activation energy. And also, they will, they will collide more frequently because they're moving around faster, so they'll hit each other sooner. So temperature really, really affects the speed of a reaction. Also, the geometry and orientation of the molecule. Um, some molecules, they have to collide in a very specific way for the reaction to occur. Others, it doesn't matter as much. And also, the presence of a catalyst. Uh, so a catalyst is a substance that uh, increases the speed of the reaction by providing an alternative reaction pathway that's lower in energy. Uh, and that causes the reaction to go fast, is the activation energy. Um, <clears throat> so... How will an increase in the concentration of reactants uh, affect the reaction rate? So the brackets again mean concentration. Um, <clears throat> it's because if there's more molecules, they're more likely to collide with one another. Every collision is a, is a possibility for a reaction. Um, so in general, uh, the rate of a reaction is expressed by the rate law. Uh, so the rate is some rate constant times concentrations of reactants uh, to some power, and that power is referred to as the order. Uh, in this, and so here's the rate law written in general terms, K being the rate constant, 
and then X and Y being the orders of the reaction with respect to reactant A and reactant B. And these A in, con in brackets mean concentration of A, B in brackets mean concentration of B. So if we consider some reactants uh, where A and B are the reactants, C and D are the products, then the rate law will be written like this. Notice the rate C and D are not written. Um, they, those would only correspond to the reaction going backwards say if these two were reacting or these were making something else but the rate law is written in terms of reactants reactants are going on to make products <clears throat> so the rate law the rate law what's the appropriate rate law it's the one written right up here we don't know notice though we still haven't put any orders in for x and y this is because the orders are not necessarily directly related to the coefficients in the balance equation these x and y are not necessarily one here. Uh, they can only be determined by experiment uh, because they depend on exactly the mechanism of the reaction, which bonds are breaking and which bonds are being formed and in what order. And so that is not shown here, this chemical reaction written, this chemical equation, or D, and or an experiment to determine, you would need an experiment to determine the actual you did that in chem. So notice here, these are two reactions where the reactants and the products both have the same starting potential energy. Uh, so they're both equally exergonic, right? So if I were to look here, the free energy right here, this difference right here, this is the delta G. But I don't care about the delta G. Um, because right now I'm trying to decide which reaction is faster or slower. And the delta G does not tell us that. It just tells us, you know, how much product we're going to get versus reactant at, at equilibrium. This is exergonic. Uh, delta G is negative. So this reaction would be spontaneous. It would produce more products than reactants. But what we're asking about is which will do it faster. And reaction, the reaction on the left side here will be faster than the one on the right because the activation energy is lower. The activation energy is the energy to go from the reactant molecules to what's known as a, it's going to be called a transition state. That's a high energy state that once you've reached that state, the reaction is now, the, the reactant molecule is at its highest energy, and then these will in turn continue to react and make products. So uh, notice that second reaction here is slower because it requires a greater energy to reach its transition state uh, which is often indicated by a double cross here like um, and so this reaction will go more slowly the reason is because there will be fewer molecules at any one point that collide with enough energy to produce the transition state uh, for this reaction whereas in this reaction, there will be many more molecules that are able to reach the collision energy required to produce a transition state. And once they do, they'll go on to create the products. If we increase the temperature, what we've done is we've increased the average kinetic energy of the molecule. Uh, notice that even, so the blue line here representing lower temperature, the red line representing higher Notice that even at the lower temperature, there's some, some of the molecules are very slow uh, here. So this represents a small number of molecules with this kinetic energy. Most of them here have this intermediate kinetic energy. And then there's a small number of molecules that have a very large kinetic energy. Those with the largest kinetic energy, when they collide, they, they will collide with sufficient energy to surpass the activation. But that's a very small number of the molecules any one, over any one period of time. If we increase the temperature, we increase the average kinetic energy. Notice that some of the molecules are still moving slowly. Some, but a lot more are moving a lot faster. Uh, a lot more are moving with a kinetic energy that if they collide will exceed the activation energy. So you can see raising the temperature can really, really increase the rate of the reaction because not only does it do the molecules move faster and will hit each other more frequently, a much, much greater proportion of them has an energy that exceeds the activation. Thus, we'll go on to react when they collide. <clears throat>
Um, <clears throat> how might the geometry in the sterics affect the reaction? Well, let's say that we have a reaction uh, with a molecule here, and we have the bromine and the hydrogen. And we want this reaction here, uh, this, this molecule here, to react uh, with iodine. Well, in the case of the iodine, the iodine can collide in any, in any way, really, uh, to make this reaction occur. Uh, but for this molecule on the left, for this reaction to occur, this bond right here between carbon and bromine will have to be broken. So the co collision will have to occur from one side of the molecule in order to make the reaction happen. And so the geometry in the sterics can affect the probability that a collision will occur. Uh, if there are mole if there's a molecule where the, s the bond that needs to break is really surrounded and protected, that can make the reaction go a lot s slower. Um, if we have a catalyst, this catalyst uh, will do a couple of things. Um, if one of the reactants interacts with the catalyst, it may put the catalyst in the proper orientation so that if it collides with the, the other reactant molecule, it will be sure to collide in the correct orientation. Also, often bonds are weakened upon interaction of a reactant and a catalyst, and so that helps to lower the collision energy required to break the bond and, and form new ones. And so when we have a catalyst in the reaction, what occurs is that uh, it changes the way that the, the steps that will, will occur in the reaction, the way in which the reaction will occur, because the catalyst will interact with the reactant molecules somehow and either weaken their bonds or help to orient them in the right direction for a reaction. This will, uh, this will decrease the activation. And so we can see here, for a reaction without a catalyst, uh, it may have had a very high activation energy. Reaction with a catalyst will proceed through uh, various other steps. For example, the first step might be the uh, bonding of the uh, catalyst with one of the reactant molecules, and then Maybe the reactant molecule and and the act and the catalyst complex uh, collide with the other reactant molecule. Then the uh, then the catalyst uh, is uh, its bond is broken with the with the uh, other reactant molecule, and finally the reaction occurs. And all these steps were are lower in activation energy than the activation energy that you'd have without the catalyst. So the the catalyst uh, lowers the activation energy by providing an alternate reaction uh, mechanism that will be lower in activation. Um, so it's important to distinguish between kinetics and thermodynamics now. And when looking at the, uh, the energy diagrams, which parts are relevant? Uh, if we want to know ki kinetics are about the speed or the rate of the reaction, we're concerned with the activation energy which will be the difference in energy between the reactants and the highest point in, the, um, in the, the energy diagram here. So this is where the energy of the transition state is. Uh, but when we're talking about thermodynamics and how much product and reactant will have at equilibrium, but not how fast the reaction is, we're talking about how many products and reactants will have in equilibrium. We care about the delta G, which is the difference in free energy between reactants and products. So notice that these are completely separate uh, concerns here. A reaction can go fast, but be uh, you know, not as spontaneous as a reaction that goes slower or, or vice versa. You can have a very slow reaction that's very spontaneous, but it doesn't go very fast. Um, and look at the activation energy to see how fast a reaction will go, and at the delta G to know whether that reaction will be spontaneous. So, for example, this is a kind of analysis we're going to do a lot in class. We'll look at two energy diagrams and say, and ask which path will be favored. Uh, in this case, it's pretty, uh, <coughs> it's pretty clear cut. So we see that there are two reactions that could occur. They both start with reactants A and B. One reaction produces products C and D. The other produces products E and F. Uh, when it comes to the activation energy, the activation energy to produce products C and D is smaller 
than the activation energy that would be required to produce products E and F. This, here, that would be this react, this activation. So we can see that um, the reaction to produce E and F will go slower than the reaction to produce E and D. Now, when it comes to delta G, we can see that the delta G for, um, for the reaction A and B to produce C and D, delta G is larger than the delta G if it were to produce E and F. Whoops, a little bit off there. Right there. This delta G here is much smaller than the delta G to produce C and D. So the reaction to produce C and D is not only faster, but it's faster. It is also more spontaneous. So clearly, the reaction pathway to produce C and D is uh, both kinetically and thermodynamic. Now we have a situation that's a little bit uh, trickier, right? So this can commonly occur in reactions. And it, so it ends up being that well, whatever we have more of in the end really actually not only depends on the spontaneity reaction, but also how long we let the reaction go. So here we can see that in terms of activation energy, the activation energy for the production of E and F is smaller. So this is a smaller activation energy. So we will get these products faster. However, the delta G for producing C and D is much larger. So this reaction is more spontaneous. And so how much we have at a certain period of time of products is going to depend not only on, um, you know, it's, it's going to depend not only on which reaction is more spontaneous, which is C and D, but also how long the reaction is allowed to go. The longer it goes, the more C and D will be produced and the less E and F. However, for uh, the, the E and F will be produced much faster. So if the reaction is, um, if we collect the products earlier, we'll have more E and F. Uh, so you can see how um, there can be introduced a lot of complexity in competing reactions like this, uh, where one might be more spontaneous in the long term, but uh, more of a particular reaction will be produced in the short term. Especially if these are inter intermediates, the ones that are produced faster are going to have a big impact on our reaction. Um, how can temperature be used to control which set of, of products predominate? Uh, well, if we raise the temperature, then we'll increase the number of, of molecules that have the activation energy to produce C and D. So at higher temperatures, we'll get more C and D. Um, because more, more of the molecules will be able to achieve the activation energy. However, at a lower temperature, where very few of the molecules have the kinetic energy to uh, reach the transition state up here, at a lower temperature, we might get a lot more E. So this is the kind of analysis that we Again, notice that in Chem 151, we were calculating the rates. We were calculating the Gibbs free energy exactly. Um, what's more useful in organic chemistry is just having a, a general sense of whether they're positive or negative uh, and how big they are. Um, knowing the exact numbers is not as important in it like this unless we will really want to dig into the details. But practically speaking, it just depends a lot on, you know, how long we run our reaction and what temperature. That's why in the lab, for example, sometimes it can be hard to figure out why a synthesis went the way it did. Uh, because there are competing factors here. Time, temperature, just like when you're cooking. If you wonder why your meal doesn't come out exactly the same way mom cooks it, uh, it's, it's usually something to do with time and temperature and the way the ingredients were mixed and so forth. The same is true uh, for an um, organic reaction, chemical reaction.
Um, so that's why sometimes it can be hard to figure out uh, why a reaction turned out different. But it's so important in lab for you to write down your, your observations, your written observations, in case you notice something that's important later. Uh, so now we're, I've started to use these word transition states and intermediates. Let's exactly define those. So when a reaction is happening, it will go through several steps. Um, it will often go through several steps. Uh, and those steps will involve transition states, which are high energy, unstable molecules uh, that, that are, are a in between, between a reactant and a product or an intermediate. And then you get a stable, a somewhat stable product uh, after that, that, uh, that transition state has been achieved, it will then continue to react and produce what's known as an intermediate. If sometimes there's no intermediate, sometimes it directly produces the product in one step. But more often, reactions uh, require multiple steps. And the number of steps here will be the number of bumps. So the number of steps, that's very important, in, equals the number of bumps in the reaction. So in this case, this reaction is, is proceeding through three steps. And so then it will have two intermediates. Uh, and every step has its own activation energy here, right, to reach transition. Then you produce a somewhat stable intermediate. Uh, but eventually, if you allow this to continue to react, it will produce a much, much more stable product. And so here, for example, in this one, we'd have this being the activation energy for the first step, at least. The overall activation energy, you're going to have to actually get all the way up to this energy to actually complete the reaction. And then here, this is the delta G. For the there's, there's one more activation. Actually, three of them. Actually, this would, if I'm getting, being real exact here, um, this would be the activation energy. Step one here, have an activation energy. Step two, like that. We call this activation energy one, activation energy two. This one here, activation energy three for the three steps. Each of these steps has its own activation energy. Uh, and eventually, if you leave this reaction long enough, it will produce the products. So this is something that's new, right? In the past, we weren't really, like in general chemistry, we weren't really as concerned with each individual step in the reaction, or what's known as the reaction mechanism. But in organic chemistry, um, knowing a lot about the reaction mechanism will tell us how to predict what will occur in the reaction. And they will generally involve several steps. So in the energy diagram, the number of steps in the reaction is equal to the bumps. The peaks here correspond to highly unstable transition states that must be achieved to proceed in the reaction. And intermediates are semi-stable products that can go on to produce other products that are, that are much more stable. So when it comes to a transition state, a transition state is, is a, an unstable a molecule that occurs at the energy maxima. So when this reaction is occurring, these two, this chloride ion and this methyl bromide or bromomethane collide, and when they do, the bond between the carbon and the bromine begins to break. So in the transition state, we uh, represent this as a dotted line. At the same time, the bond between chlorine and carbon is beginning to form. And so the transition state is when you're somewhere in between where the, the bromine bond is breaking but hasn't quite broken, the chlorine bond is forming but hasn't quite fully formed. And we have negative partial charges on each the chlorine and the bromine because the chlorine is starting to lose its additional electron to share it to form this bond. And the bromine is beginning to gain an additional electron as it becomes a bromide. So that's why we have these partial negative charges here indicated by the delta. Uh, finally, once we reach its transition state, then the reaction continues. So on the, on the horizontal axis, we have the so-called reaction coordinate, which is representing the process, the progress of the reaction. Vertical axis, we have the Gibbs free energy. 
um, the, the free energy of the reactants and the products and so forth. So uh, after this occurs, then the bromine bond continues to go on and break. The chlorine bond gets stronger and stronger until we have a full bond between carbon and chlorine. And we have the bromide ion, and these are our stable products. Uh, transition states are not easy to spot. They're there for only fractions of a fraction of a second. Um, and, and so they're, they're very unstable because they, they don't have full bonds, right? Uh, they don't have a, a full bond. They're not, they have these partially broken bonds here. Uh, these are going to go on to either fully form or to break. Um, in many reactions, as I said, there are multiple steps. So this is a reaction that is two steps. Um, and so in this reaction, it's proceeding a little bit differently than we saw in the previous reaction. What happens first is that the bond between the carbon and the bromine here breaks. Um, and so when that breaks, uh, we end up with the bromide ion. So in terms of arrows, what's occurring? Let's just go ahead and draw an arrow here. We're going to start drawing arrows for these reactions very soon. Uh, what's going on is this bond is breaking. So if we're drawing an arrow here, that means these electrons are going to the bromine. And you can see this is now a bromide ion. And this carbon is making three bonds with no lone pairs. So it's a carbocation. And then we still have the chloride ion. So this is what's called an intermediate. So the transition state here would be like if we have this and we, the bond to the bromine is starting to break. So that's the transition state. We often show with the uh, little double cross here. And then finally, uh, so this is, this is the, the bromine bond about to break. And when it breaks, then we get the carbocation and the bromide. So this is the intermediate. Then uh, we have go through another transition state where uh, the bond to chlorine is now beginning to form. So this is the second transition. And then uh, the reaction proceeds, and finally the bond between carbon and chlorine is fully formed. Uh, so the intermediate occurs at a relative energy me uh, minimum. It's lower in energy than either of the transition states, although you can see that it's not particularly low in energy, not particularly stable. Uh, this is going to go on to continue to react and produce the products, or in some cases go back and recover the reactant. Uh, but the, the uh, activation energy to go forward here, uh, the energy to go forward, which is right here, the activation, is smaller than the activation energy backwards. I'll call this E activation reverse. Uh, and so the, this reaction is going to go much or significantly more quickly in the forward direction. So this brings us to what's called the Hammond postulate. Uh, in the, ha the Hammond postulate just says that if you are following the reaction progress along this reaction curve, this energy diagram, the reaction curve, the closer you are to the energy of a reactant or product, the closer your uh, reactant, your your substance resembles that uh, reactant or product. So when we get to the transition state, uh, we've got the bromine bond here between carbon and bromine partially broken, chlorine bond partially formed. As we go further and the energy lowers, at that point, the bromine carbon bond is continuing to break even further. So the bromine is getting further and further away from the carbon. And the chlorine carbon bond is continuing to form. So the chlorine is getting closer to the carbon and is more and more closer and closer to having the carbon bond form. So the closer you are to reactant or product along this, uh, this reaction coordinate, the closer the structure is to the final structure that you're going to get. That's the Hammond postulate. It sounds simple, but ends up being useful as, as we move forward to thinking about what would be the, uh, the shape of the transition state and all of the uh, unstable intermediate along the way. Um, so here we can see, and th this is exactly what we use the Hammond postulate for. So when we have an endothermic process, let's say like this, where uh, the reactants are lower in Gibbs free energy products, uh, the transition state is closer in energy to the product. So the structure of the transition state will be more similar to that of the products than to the reactants. 
However, in an exothermic reaction, uh, like this one here, the reactants are higher in energy, products are lower in energy. Uh, the transition state is closer in energy to the reactants. So the transition state in terms of structure will mo more closely represent uh, that, uh, resemble rather, that of the reactants products. And this is useful for telling us about what we think the shapes of the molecules will be. So later we'll want to have a general idea of, you know, what is the structure, three dimensions, of a reactant or product or a transition state. And we'd see that the transition state should have a, a structure that's closer to the reactants than it is to the product. It's much closer. Uh, so let's say we have a general, uh, a general, um, uh, reaction like this. So we have a reaction that's going in two steps. Okay, so this here is step one. This is step two. And when we're done, um, then uh, the, the, the reactants uh, A here is one reactant and D is another. So if you add this, you have A and D right here. And then B is a product and E is another product. And C is an intermediate. We can tell because it's neither a reactant nor a product. See, it's not in the reactants, it's not in the products. It is produced and then it's consumed. So this is an intermediate. C is the intermediate. <clears throat> okay. Um, and so if we're drawing a diagram here, well, first of all, we can see that A has to be broken up into B and C. Uh, so that is something that is going, uh, is, uh, it's going to require some energy probably. And let's let, we know this is gonna be now, we can see that this is gonna be two steps. So we're gonna have two bumps in our reaction diagram. So draw the reaction, have this reaction coordinate. And this one's going to be delta G. And and uh, we were told that this is an exergonic reaction. So what that tells us is that uh, when we start with our reactants, A, uh, it's a, a and D, basically, A plus D, this is going to be higher in energy than our products, uh, D plus E. And in this reaction, um, A and D are going to separate. We're going to put in some energy. There's going to be an activation. Energy. And then we'll produce a semi-stable intermediate, C. C will go on to react again. Then we'll be in. And so we get um, at this point we start with A and D, then we have our our intermediate. So at this point we're going to have uh, B and C. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have B and we're gonna have C, and then uh, C is going to be the intermediate, and then it'll go on and B and. Uh, and the, the question at the end asks, how would this diagram look different if it were endergonic? Well, if it were endergonic, it would look something like this. The A and D would be lower in energy. The B and E would be higher in energy. And we'd have this. We'd still have to have two bumps for two steps. But it would be like that. And so the difference here is that the delta G, there's delta G right here. Delta G is negative, whereas here, Delta G is positive. <clears throat> so as we move forward, we're going to start to talk about um, the, the individual steps that occur in the we're going to analyze them based on their kinetics and their thermodynamics.
activation energies and the delta G. Uh, we're going to start by talking about ionic reactions as opposed to radical reactions. So remember from the beginning, we said, the beginning of this chapter, we said uh, radicals are produced when you have homolytic bond cleavages, meaning a bond cleavage where each atom gets one electron. Where most of our reactions that we start that we talk about are going to be ionic reactions, which means a a uh, bond breaks and one atom gets both electrons, uh, the other atom gets none. So ionic are also called polar reactions. They start due to the force of attraction between uh, atoms of of opposite charges. So for example, uh, when we have molecules like all the hydrocarbons, like propane or something. These have no polar bonds, and they, they, uh, there's nothing really to start the reaction going. And that's why for these, they tend to be fantastically unreactive, the hydrocarbons. What we need is something that has a, a, a polarity to it, uh, so we can have this attraction between positive and negative charges. Uh, ionic reactions are they're motivated by the fact that they want to have, every atom wants to have a octet except hydrogen so this tends to drive reactions notice here again carbon has a full octet there's no polar bonds there's nothing to really attract uh, uh, initiate a reaction between these nonpolar molecules however with polar molecules uh, often there is a positive and a negative area to the molecule and those tend to be the ones that interact and get involved in these ionic reactions um, so here, if we have chlorine, chlorine uh, has an electronegativity of 3.0, and for carbon, it's 2.5. So there's a difference in electronegativity there. Chlorine has the greater electronegativity. Uh, and so this area here by the chlorine ends up being, uh, you know, partially negative, and the carbon is partially positive. And so now that there's this charge difference here. Uh, positive things will be attracted to the chlorine, negative things will be attracted to the carbon, and this can help to initiate chemical reactions uh, when molecules collide. Here, the lithium is much lower in electronegativity than the carbon. It's a metal, right? And so uh, the carbon has a much higher electronegativity, so it's going to be negative for the lithium. It will be pos partially positive charge, and this arrow represents more electron density here being pulled towards the carbon, whereas in this case, more electron density being pulled to the chlorine. And these are going to produce both ionic reactions, but different ones. One where here is where the carbon would end up taking the electrons for itself, whereas this one, the, the chlorine, would take. Um, so when an atom uh, carries a pot formal or partial negative charge uh, and available pair of electrons, it's considered a nucleophile, okay, a nucleophile. The key thing is the electrons here. So electrons are negative, and so that available pair of electrons that are negative is going to go and seek out something that's positive, right? Negative and positive attract. The nu nuclei are positive. So by, we're saying something negative with an available pair of electrons is a nucleophile. File means love. Nucleo means nucleus. It loves a nucleus. It loves positive things. Of course, negative things like positive things, right? Um, so in the case of uh, these uh, here, these are nucleophiles in various different ways. Um, this, this one here, this will be a nucleophile because of the negative charge on the carbon. And if this bond breaks for some reason, this carbon will be a carbanion of a negative charge. So that's practically speaking what we would be looking at. So we'd be looking at carbanion, a carbon with a lone pair. So it would have a negative form of charge. It would behave like a nucleophile. This really, really wants to find something positive. Uh, this ethoxide ion, again, it has lone pairs here, which are negative. Great nucleophile. Ethanol, also a nucleophile. Uh, it has a lone pair of electrons that could be donated to go and make a bond, right? Uh, it could be donated to something positive. But because it's not negative in charge, it's not quite as good of a nucleophile as ethoxide is. Um, finally, uh, the electrons in pi bonds, these are also nucleophiles. So these are uh, pairs of electrons. These can actually go and they can make bonds to like whatever atom. And so uh, those carbon-carbon double bonds, 
the electrons and the pi bonds. These are also nucleophiles. So when there's two electrons that can be donated to create a bond, uh, it can uh, be a nucleophile. And there's a, another word we use for that in chapter three, uh, right before exam one. We called that a Lewis base. And so good nucleophiles are good Lewis. They will donate their lone pair to go and grab something, whether it be a proton or something. Um, now, on the opposite side, when, a, when an atom carries a, a formal or po partial positive charge, it's called an electrophile. It can accept a pair of electrons. So, you know, if it's got a positive charge, well, that loves negative charges, right? Electro meaning electron, negative file. It's a negative lover. So things that are positive, they're attracted to negative things, right? Uh, so here's some examples here. Uh, um, in the case of, here we're talking now about the carbon that's attached to the chlorine. Uh, so the, that carbon, it would be attracted to things that are negative because it's partially positive. The chlorine, again, has greater electronegativity than the carbon. It pulls the electrons towards itself. Uh, and so the carbon here, which is lacking electrons now, positive, and so it is an electrophile. It's attracted to negative things, electrons. Or if we have a carbocation like this one here, also an electrophile attracted to negative things, electrons. Um, what's the difference between an electrophile and a Lewis acid? Nothing. There are two ways of talking about the same thing. A good Lewis acid is also a electrophile. So if we look here, uh, what are the nucleophilic and electrophilic sites on the molecule? So really we're looking for polar bonds. Uh, so in the case of oxygen to carbon here, there's a polar bond. The, remember oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, these all love electrons. So there's going to be kind of a negativist charge here. Uh, in the case of this oxygen, we have the negative full charge here. There's going to be a partially uh, negative charge on the nitrogen, partially negative charge on the oxygen. And the carbons they are attached to will be missing electrons. So we see that the electrons will be pulled from this carbon. So this will be a partially positive carbon. And I'm going to actually put those in blue just to make it a little bit easier to pick out here. So partially positive carbon right here. Uh, this one, again, the electrons are being pulled towards the oxygen. So this carbon is partially positive. Here, these electrons are being pulled towards nitrogen. So these are partially positive. Uh, and then in this case, it's a little bit different because the, there's a full charge here. So this oxygen has a full positive charge. We can't have, we can have resonance, right, uh, here. So there is resonance in this case. We have a pi bond between two atoms of differing electronegativity. So we could... If we had the resonance form, we'd have this here, and then this would be partially positive. So this whole area is, is partially positive here. And, and likewise, this one's partially negative. Uh, we have a whole resonance situation here. It's an allylic lone pair, right? So then like this, and we have a lone pair here. So this whole region here is like a negative. This whole region here is positive. And so uh, in terms of the... Uh, the uh, electrophiles, the electrophile would be everything that's positive. So I, I guess I should put this in, just to be consistent, I should put this actually in blue. So go ahead and do that. This is blue. positive, right? So this area, this whole area here is positive. So this would be uh, electrophilic. All the positive blue parts would be electrophilic, and all the negative red parts would be uh, a nucleophilic. Negative attracted to nucleus, attracted to positive. Nucleophil. Nucleophilic. Hold on. This nucleophilic means loves positive, right? Loves positive. So that's all the negative things. This means it loves negative. Loves all the. So the nucleophilic loves all the positive things, all these carbons here. Electro, sorry, uh, electrophilic loves all these positive things. Sorry. Let me say that one more time. <laughs> Repeat. Nucleophilic loves positive, right? So that's going to be all these ne negative loves. Electrophilic loves negative. That's going to be all these partially loves uh, electrons.
Uh, lastly, for our last lecture of this week, we're going to talk about uh, how we're going to draw arrows to indicate mechanism. So now at this point, we've talked about um, how we evaluate uh, relative structures, whether they're electrophiles or nucleophiles. We talked about uh, the structure of intermediates and reactive intermediates. Lastly, we're going to put this all together, and we're going to talk about uh, identifying the nucleophile, the electrophile, determining which bonds will be broken, which bonds will be formed, and drawing arrows that indicate the movement of electrons to break bonds and to form bonds. So in this case, we're going to be using arrows that are different from, for example, resonance. When it came to resonance, we never broke any bonds. Uh, these were, these are resonant, the resonance arrows were just meant to show the movement of electrons. But now we're talking about bonds being broken, bonds being formed. So we're going to have new, four new ways of talking about electron movement. And uh, that's going to be the focus of the last lecture for this week. See you next time.